so i will now welcome each of the speakers individually but before i do that let me share an interesting fact with all of you all our speakers tonight are global citizens they live in a particular nation but work takes them all around the world so our first speaker tonight is dr daniel langer good morning daniel so to tell you something about daniel he is half german half portuguese he has spent his growing up years in nigeria he has also spent lot of time in japan he has also worked in Jap in spain work takes him across the globe in different parts of the world he is a global keynote speaker as well as an author and on top of that he is phd in luxury brand management a very few of us can achieve that kind of feat so good morning again daniel yeah how are you yes. feeling thank you so much for the introduction and it's a great pleasure and privilege to be here and um, share my views on um, share my views on luxury with all of you and discuss with you okay before you do that let me share show the book this is the book this is my personal copy it is written by dr daniel langer it's an autograph copy and he gifted to me 2 years ago when we met in scottsdale so and i would recommend all of you to grab a copy or read it on kindle right now there is a scheme on kindle it's available on kindle unlimited and all the subscribers can get their copy free of charge so daniel you have worked across continents but you have not been to india though you have many friends you are yet to come to india so i would like to know when someone like me says india what is the first thing that comes to your mind over to you daniel you know um for to me when i think about um india first i think about the very rich culture um that is um in in um in india and um you know very much culture history and obviously also a, a very big propensity for uh, the luxury world awesome so i am reminded of a quote by george bernard shaw he said those who know do and those who don't teach but daniel you have proved george bernard shaw wrong because you are teaching the students of pepperdine university in california but you also have a track record you have worked with corporates so i think uh, it would be really interesting there are a lot of students who are who have joined in tonight so they would be looking forward to hear your views so thank you i'll come back to you once again and now i would like to move on to katrina Katrina Hello. your name your name is familiar to all indians because it is also the name of bollywood superstar katrina kaif i really well, she, <laughs> she is very popular and you are no less you are also a star in your own right you are the star of internet you have so many followers on instagram you are a role model to budding designers you also are into education field you conduct so many courses i attended one of your course where you made the jewelers aware of the mistakes they are committing while marketing their products online on instagram so to tell you uh, to tell uh, the audience a little bit about you a fun fact katrina is born russian she lives in paris she is married to a frenchman who has a spanish surname and her son is british by birth truly a global personality <laughs> she is a globe trotter she has been to india many many times and once the lockdown is lifted i think we can expect her very soon so having said that katrina let us know about your relationship with india and indians personally as well as professionally please begin 
I think for me, it's uh, the, the personal relationship was much stronger because I was always welcomed with an open heart and I never forget the hospitality and how people are really open hearted in India. It really stands out, uh, you know, in Europe, it's not the same, but there I was like a part of the big family, the big jewelry family when I went to um, one of the first exhibitions there. But also for me, uh, um, it's funny association. I uh, personally love elephants and uh, peacocks. And uh, when I was in India, I had this elephant, right? So it was always uh, in my memory. Uh, and peacock is uh, one of the you know most important birds. So I admire it. And uh, that's how I get associated with, uh, with India as well. So awesome. Mostly uh, like personal level. <laughs> but uh, tell us about the Indian jewelry. How do you find Indian jewelry? For me, I think it's uh, one of the cultures to admire in terms of jewelry appreciation because it's a uh, it's a big piece of big part of culture. Uh, it's in your blood, you know. You you pass this uh, knowledge, admiration for jewelry through generations, and it's admirable to see. Um, I think I can really see this changes happening also in the jewelry world of India. And uh, I think there's more and more companies coming out who uh, offer something less uh, for an occasion, for example. It's a big part of uh, uh, culture to wear uh, flamboyant jewelry, you know, big perus for weddings or birthdays or for celebrations. But also I can see now more brands uh, offering something which can be worn on a daily basis, not necessarily for uh, a special night. Great. So now I would like to uh, say a few words about Melvin George. Melvin, well, he's Canadian by birth, but for the last 22 years, he's been living in Dubai. He has worked for all the major global luxury houses. He was the brand manager of Omega, which belongs to the Swatch Group. He was associated with LVMH, Tag Heuer brand. And his last assignment was as the managing director of Panerai for the Middle East, which belongs to the Rishma. So while everything, he had a very cushy job, I must say that Melvin is a brave man. He had the guts to launch his own brand, Lagado Watches, amidst the pandemic. And having said that, uh, his mastery is with the luxury sector, Swiss luxury watches in particular. Also, he knows India better than most of us do. Because he told me that before the pandemic, he used to spend at least one week, week per month in India. And he loves Bombay more than Delhi. Uh -huh. OK, and lastly, as I said, he's a brave man. So uh, when I approached uh, Melvin uh, for inviting him to be a panelist. He readily agreed. But then, uh, after confirmation, he was tested COVID positive. And he has really come out of the difficult situation. And I admire his guts. So now that he's back with us, I will now ask him about his views, his relationships with India, and the role which India as a nation plays as far as the Swiss watch market is concerned. So please begin, uh, Melvin. Well, thank you, Anil, for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this amazing group. I think it's a uh, it's privilege, and especially to talk about a market which uh, is close to my heart. So my journey with India started in 2007, and it was with uh, Rishmo Group when I was managing uh, Panerai. And um, one thing that stuck in my mind, you know, I, I traveled throughout India, I've been north, south, you know, Chandigarh, Hyderabad, Ahmedabad, not only tier one cities, but also tier two cities. And, um, but one thing stuck in my mind that, um, and, and I always say, I used to say, how do I, what do I call India? And how do, how, how do I define India? And for me, it's incredible India. And this is a, it, it kind of like popped up when there, there was a, an advertising on CNN where you know they're advertising tourism to India, and they always mention incredible India under the under the ad, and because India is 1.3 billion people, India is rich in culture, very diverse. Uh, you know, north is different than than south. Uh, the food changes, the languages changes, retail and shopping habits changes from part to part. Um, to me, India, when you talk about luxury, there is a, a root and history for for India. 
it goes back to the early 1900s when Jack Cartier used to visit um, India and used to meet, meet with the Maharajas and Mughals. And uh, it was also the time that, you know, there was this, um, I would say, appreciation for the Parisian style of making jewelry and where, you know, gems and stones were sold to Europeans and, and Cartier was started to make this jewelry where it was also the art deco time. So um, speaking about India, I think another thing that used to come to my mind, especially when I managed India where retail was done in the lobbies of hotels, when you look at, you know, watches and jewelry, and then of course things evolve ever since, but I always say that India is healing and India is is showing its, its strength today. Um, I mean, again, it's, uh, I'm a true believer in the market when it comes to luxury. Great. So now we uh, invite uh, Daniel once again. So Daniel, please, uh, we would like to hear what's going on in the business of luxury around the world. Because you have been very active. Uh, you have been doing so many sessions different parts of uh, people from different parts of the world. You are a very active uh, writer. You write for uh, South China Morning Post. You write for Jing Daily. So tell us what's happening around the world. You know, if you if I look at right now at the, at the luxury market, basically glo globally, um, Maybe with the exception of China, let's go to China um, maybe a little bit uh, a little bit later. But if we look at the at the world, we have um, two very major forces that um, that are disrupting um, luxury right now. The first, obviously, is um, is, is the pandemic, and especially um, Europe, um, North America have been extremely hard hit uh, with that, um, with lockdowns and um, huge disruption in the traditional business models that has first of all had a huge impact on the numbers of um, most luxury brands. So if you look at the numbers of the luxury houses that have been published last week or the, the week before, um, most of them, um, if you take the total 2020 numbers were negative. So we had for the first time in many, many years, a, a negative um, um, number for the total luxury market. But this was very much driven by short-term disruption, not by a um, kind of maybe long-term trend or anything that, that um, should be of concern in a, on a long run. Um, so the prospects for luxury are, are actually very, very positive. However, um, there is a second uh, big disruption force that most brands are still underestimating, and uh, these are younger consumers. So either millennials, so those are the consumers that um, typically, depending on which definition you use, are between maybe 25 years old right now and about 40. And then also the Generation Z that um, are typically consumers that are seen as below 25. So these are major disruption forces because especially if we start with Gen Z, the youngest consumers, they are extremely digital. So they grew up with digital devices. Um, they um, are what many call digital natives. And this has a lot of um, very important factors on the way they view the world. So first of all, they do much more of what I like to call their homework than the elder generation. So they really scrutinize brands. They, they really want to know what is behind the brands. And they basically are non, they don't do compromises. I would say they are the most difficult customers for brands to reach because they are so well informed that if a brand is not really giving them value, then they just move on. And so a lot of people sometimes approach me and say, you know, Daniel, why should I take um, even gen Generation Z into consideration? They're not buying me, they're too young. Some people say they don't have the money, um, they're not luxury consumers. And I always like to say this is completely, um, you know, this, this doesn't make any sense. So these consumers are maybe simply not with a brand because maybe the brand is not relevant to them. And so brands really have to, will have to think in a complete different way to address these young digital consumers. And the way, for example, when we work with brands and build brand strategies for them, the way we do this now in um, 2020, 2021 is completely different than we would have done this three or four years ago. And so the way how brands have to think is changing dramatically. And 
I feel like the luxury industry, as many other industries, are completely underestimating this trend right now and um, are not really prepared for the future. And um, in a lot of cases, we are going to see brands that have been maybe the leading brands for um, sometimes decades simply disappearing in the in the next couple of years because they will not be able to connect uh, with these young generations and one of the other things and observations is when we look from a consumer perspective is the speed of change has never been as fast as it's now so um, before there was a lot of loyalty for brands there was a lot of maybe patience that consumers had for subpar service or for other things that the brands didn't do well. Now there is so much more competition. There is so much more choice for consumers. If a brand is not top notch in everything they do, they just don't have a chance anymore. So that's basically on, on a global perspective. So I would basically say we are in a, and this is for me maybe when we speak about this luxury 4.0, we are in a completely different world, very digital, extremely fast, extremely demanding consumers. Um, much faster trends, much faster things um, than ever before, accelerating speed. And this means a complete different way how brands have to um, operate in the market. Then maybe also in, in interestingly and important when we look at the global luxury scale is China. So um, as you all know, China has become the most important par place for uh, luxury in the world. So if you take Chinese consumers as a total, they account for right now for about, if you take the estimates between 40 to 45 percent of global luxury consumption. Um, so if you look at the particular Chinese market, the market grew last year by more than 60 percent, so six zero, while the global market has been negative. And this is an enormous kind of maybe disconnect on the first glance. So but why is the market or has been the market growing so fast? It has been growing because a lot of the Chinese consumers were not able to travel through to travel restrictions. So now they are kind of back home and um, don't, cannot use their travel budgets that they may have put aside. So what do they do? They first spend in China. We call this repatriation of luxury spending. And then they have maybe redirected spending for travel into other categories such as jewelry. Those effects, um, and this is also a warning that I always give to brands, those effects are very likely one-time effects that will not um, continue um, this much. So um, the Chinese luxury market has continued to grow um, also because much many more consumers are going to be able to afford luxury goods right now among the 1.4 billion Chinese, around maybe 400 million can afford to buy luxury. And in the next decade, it will be from 400 million to 800 million. So there will be a huge growth in the market just from a demographic, demographic perspective. But this extreme growth that we have been seeing year on year um, is very likely a one-time effect. And I also often advise luxury brands not to take this too lightly because what they were able to compensate the downfall in other regions with sales in, in China, at least partly in many cases, but this um, extreme tendency is not going to go on for the future. So maybe in short, to summarize what I was just saying is, there's a lot of change going on in the marketplace um, more than ever before. I would say um, to, to me, I, always, I love change and I love disruption. And I think the disruption gives unbelievable opportunity for, for new players, but also for brands that play it right. But the rules of the game have completely changed. Nothing in luxury is as it was three or four or five or six years ago. And the requirements to win in the market are completely different. Now it's about digital excellence. And digital, and digital excellence is not just about, um, you know, I don't know, a nice website and so on. It's also mastering the tools um, behind. And I just throw in maybe a couple of uh, buzzwords that we are going to discuss, I think also later is artificial intelligence in managing luxury brands right now for me is indispensable. So we, we manage a lot of brands using AI technologies and I would not even know anymore without. So in, in short, huge disruption, huge change, but also enormous opportunity for those players that do it right. Awesome. Thank you for sharing the global perspective. And we have to discuss a lot more about artificial intelligence and the millennials. But for now, let me invite Katrina. Katrina, I, we would like to know from you, 
the trends happening in the jewelry, jewelry sector in different markets. But before uh, we do that, I understand that you are a pioneer as far as the social media is concerned. You started your uh, Instagram page way back in 2013, and the rest of the industry has realized the potential only four or five years ago. So start with your journey in brief and also take us through the current developments that are happening globally in jewelry. Over to you, Katrina. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, I was a little bit ahead of time when I started uh, talking about jewelry online, because that was about seven years ago when no one really can really appreciate uh, uh, the power of social media. Uh, when I started, it was something I heard unheard of, you know, to talk about high jewelry online. But I did it because I felt it was uh, my passion, not because I had a strategic plan at that time. Uh, now, of course, it's different, but um, I saw over this period of seven years how much um, online has changed the, the you know business models and help brands to get more awareness, uh, more exposure, sales as well. We see now, if we talk, for example, specifically about Instagram, that uh, since what like about a year, year and a half ago, they've brought in the Instagram boutique because they can really see the great potential of social media being as well as social, but also a selling tool. Um, and I can see brands from jewelry world uh, shifting their mind frame from feeling that, okay, they want to have um, their social media as a, a more like a landing page or uh, just for people to get to know the brand better into a way to sell through Instagram, through Facebook, through website, anything now, uh, which is not a, a brick and mortar boutique um, being reviewed in terms of the selling potential. Um, so I feel it's a great opportunity. Um, COVID, as much as it was uh, very tough, it also gave us new tools of how to reach to that client, how to communicate with the client. And I'm so on with Daniel on the fact that if you adapt, if you adjust, if you take this as an opportunity, if you change your attitude towards um, you know, communicating with your clients towards advertising your, your jewelry, um, towards, uh, you know, managing those social media and uh, bringing value as long as, um, as much as, uh, well, content, um, it will change the brand's uh, perception, it will change the brand's reach and obviously the result that they can measure in dollars and pounds and all the currency they trade. So there is a big shift uh, uh, online in the jewelry trade as in many other uh, industries, I'm sure. Oops. We have to discuss about the millennials, but uh, we'll come back to you. Uh, let me now engage with uh, Milvin. Milvin, with respect to the Swiss watch industry, I would like to know how relationships have changed in the last four years and how the pandemic is going to accelerate the change as far as relationship between the brand and the intermediary, the distributor and the retailer is concerned, and how the relationship between the brand and the consumer, direct consumer. Because what we find today in the uh, Swiss watch industry is brands are preferring to go direct to the consumer. So they need uh, intermediaries, but they are looking at franchises who can set up brand boutiques or on the other hand, they are opting for large chain stores such as Watches of Switzerland in UK and US as well as Ethos in India. So having said that, I would like to know your perspective about the changing relationships in the Swiss luxury watch sector. Please begin with me. It's a very interesting and valid question to ask, to be honest with you. I mean, um, working for the, I mean, for the three major watch and jewelry groups, um, I can tell you that it was a big discussion in Rishmo Group uh, among the uh, top management. And uh, the discussion wa was uh, why we're not doing what LV is doing with its boutiques. Why do we have to really live with retailers who are discounting our brands? 
And, and while if you go to Dior or LV, you get zero discount. And, um, and you know, when you look at the watch, it takes, it takes months to create the watch. And, and, you know, there's a lot of craftsmanship. There is a, a lot of know-how that goes into, into creating a watch. So the discussion was why we're not doing this, why we're not having a better control over our distribution, why we're not, not right there in front of the customer and talking to the customer directly. Um, and obviously, you know, running your own retail, it also you, you, you'll be rewarded with the retail margin. So not only you're wholesaling to the retailers, but you're going a step further by also getting that retail margin. So the discussion started there. And um, I think what um, was an issue as well throughout the world is that you have a lot of inconsistent, inconsistent uh, a lot of inconsistent way of managing um, the retail shops. And although they're franchise shops, but as brands and as brand owners, we wanted to have a certain, I, I, I can give you an example here in, in Dubai, for example, we wanted to have uh, a, a different, um, I would say, um, a team of uh, sales people that come from different regions who speak different languages. And we wanted also to somehow control the entire experience at, at our stores. And we wanted to make sure, let's say, if we have a customer in, in London buying a Panerai watch, that we have his database and we're connected to him. So when he appears and he pops in in our boutique in Dubai mall, we know who he is and how to treat him or what he likes or what he doesn't like. So, you know, that was the idea is that we wanted to, to have retail ex, uh, excellency and, and we wanted to have, um, and, and, you know, to be able to internalize uh, at least uh, a flagship stores, you know, some stores that are known to be in cities where, you know, you have like Dubai, for example, I would say um, and now it's a, another project which is happening in the region. It's Saudi Arabia. A lot of uh, luxury groups are actually going into, uh, into Saudi Arabia. Now, when you look at markets such as India, where to, to operate and run your own retail stores, where the local rules and regulations doesn't help and doesn't make it easy, then, you know, these kind of, I mean, the groups are always on standby to see how they can enter the market and do, do, do the retail. Now in India, when, it come, when you talk about watch and jewelry business, it's still done to retailers. Today, the Indian customer feels more comfortable to go to his you know, local jeweler, watch and jewelry jeweler, and purchases the watch or the jewel. So there's a lot of that happening in India. Uh, it will change, I think. Um, and, and I think, uh, as you mentioned, Ethos is one of the retailers that has shops throughout India. They have around 50 shops. So that is going to for sure change. But that's, I would say, having also your direct retail operation in each market, it gives you the opportunity to achieve what we call it an omni-channel approach where you have, you're really placing your customer at the center of your universe. You have obviously social media, your online platform, uh, you have your store as well, part of that. You also communicate with the customer through events and through online editing, et cetera. But really the customer is in the center and, and, and you are in direct uh, contact with the consumer. Awesome. So now uh, I would like to know from uh, Daniel and Katrina, the fine difference between KOL, key opinion leader, because Daniel is a key opinion leader and Katrina is, a, is an influencer. So what is the fine difference? Beginning uh, with uh, Daniel, can you share with us what does a KOL really do and how important is his role in the luxury industry? Well, I don't think that there is, um, I think this is more like um, semantics. Some people um, uh, speak about key opinion leaders and some people speak about influencers. Uh, typically when we speak about influence, I, I, don't, I would say it's, a, yeah, it's, it's really semantics. So very typical, the, the, the word key opinion leader is very often um, applied to the, uh, to the Chinese market because especially in China, um, there is a phenomenon called social selling where uh, a very um, uh, big 
portion of the sales for luxury brands is done through consumers or through key opinion leaders that have their own following. They have their own channels and um, through their recommendations, uh, luxury brands sell. And there is a kind of new trend now that are uh, that is basically like micro uh, key opinion leaders, so to speak, um, that are um, that are um, you know people with as maybe a smaller following but a very very strong following. Um, they're called key opinion consumers, and for brands, it's extremely important to you know identify them, know them, um, know also how to work with them, when. To to work with them, uh, working with, uh, you know, controlling what they are doing also in a sense, um, and um, always making sure that um, everything is actually building up brand equity, the non building up brand equity. Um, in this aspect, some people call them key opinion leaders, some people call them influencers. So um, I would say it's more like um, uh, uh, more semantics than anything else. Okay. Katrina, your views, please. Yeah. I think you've summed it up really well, but uh, like in every industry, also among of, well, influencers or opinion leaders, there's those who really have the opinion, uh, who have the deep knowledge of the subject. I'm not talking specifically about jewelry, but generally, there's those who really bring value in terms of understanding the industry inside out. And when they talk about, uh, you know, in my case, it's jewelry, I understand exactly what I'm talking about, how this brand is different from another which uh, event is important, you know, so many details that let's say an influencer or like a, a general term blogger might not know because they might just share pictures, pretty pictures of something that they've seen and they liked without the deep understanding and deep knowledge of the subject. So there is those who are opinion leaders who have that opinion, who educate and who uh, really bring value to their followers. And there are those who probably bring more voyeuristic pleasure, you know, uh, sharing beautiful pictures and uh, um, not maybe so much depth in terms of uh, the subject they're talking about. So it, again, they have different kind of audience. Awesome. See, uh, the common perception, at least in India, is when you say you are an influencer. If influencer is a part of your designation, people don't take you seriously because others have to call you an influencer. You can't call yourself an influencer because the moment you do that, every action of yours is perceived as if it is a paid promotion. That is the common view. But having said that, let me now invite uh, Milvin Jor because uh, he has launched uh, his brand, Lagado Watches, which is aimed at the younger consumer where the influencers and key opinion leaders have played a very important role and are playing an important role. So first, uh, since it's a new brand, uh, Milvin, why don't you share a brief presentation about your brand and also the role of influencers in promoting the garden? Absolutely. It'd be, it'd be a pleasure. I'm just going to share my screen if you give me a second. Sure. Just in my presentation, it's right here. And I'm just gonna enlarge it. There we go. So basically, I'll I'll start with with you. Just um, I'll do a quick brief um, um, introduction on why I created Legado. Um, so I left Panerai in 2018, end of 2018, and I was in my mid 40s at that time. And um, after you know working for the three large major major luxury um, watch and jewelry groups. Um, I thought to myself, this would be the best time for me to, to pursue my dream, which is to create my own watch brand, uh, which I wanted to do anyway 10 years ago, but I could not. And uh, so we started the project. Uh, uh, it's a family project. So it was, it was it's my brother and I will work on this. And we, uh, what we wanted to do is we wanted to build a brand, not based only on the experience I have, uh, as, uh, as a person who manages a region, who implements strategies and, and um, be it marketing or commercial. Uh, I, at that time, I lacked the business development and creating uh, marketing uh, guidelines. So what we did is we hired an international marketing consultant who specializes in um, millennials. And she also is considered to be a trend forecaster. And uh, we worked closely together for a duration of six months. 
uh, to conceive the God of. So our brand story is inspired by Italian, Italian finesse, enriched with a passion for quality and fueled by love for style. We're writing a new uh, story in the watch uh, making industry, bringing together a legacy of international craftsmanship with the finest materials. Legato encapsulates decades of sophistication, contemporary watch brand. In a world where individuality is celebrated like never before, Legato embodies understated elegance and versatility to modern living. So of course, today we are uh, on Instagram, Facebook, and we have our own uh, website. So the consumer and market research insight. So we wanted to really understand our audience and the customer that we are trying to appeal to. And our research uh, enable us to understand that it's generation multi-hyphenate. Multi-hyphenate is a person who feels home if he or she is in New York, Mumbai, Delhi, Shanghai, Joburg, uh, and, and basically today's world, age and ethnicity and, and nationality are less important than being, than being cultural, having cultural fluency and global exposure. Legato is proud to be sourcing the best manufacturer and designers from around the world to make a versatile watches to fit in with the global adventure. Again, millennials, if you look at the keywords, versatility, uh, adventure, these are things that we found from our research, which you'll see a little bit later in, in my presentation. Multi-hyphenated lifestyle is represented by today's aspirational way of living. You're not confined to one job, one identity, and one expression. Uh, it's, in fact, is a person who usually has multiple identities and interests and even jobs. She might be a lawyer in the daytime, yoga teacher at night. So when we worked on, on um, briefing our consultant, what we're looking at, we, of course, we um, highlighted the importance of community and freedom and, and to look at these emerging lifestyle priorities and try to link them to, uh, in, in, to make them relevant to a watch brand. The, and the four major areas we looked at is, is really the challenge of balancing work and life, especially living in this digital, uh, I would say, age. Um, you know, it's, it, you, you have work with you everywhere, at home, in the office, uh, before you sleep, when you wake up. And then, of course, express, to express themselves. So we, we are in a, a time where everyone is expressing himself or herself online, on social media. On, you know, there's always a way that you want to show your pictures, you want to give your opinion. And, 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 of course, the world is smaller today. So you have that sense of adventure. And when you make an achievement, you want to be recognized for it and have the respect for it. So we looked at all these lifestyle needs and how we can relate them uh, and, and what comes out of that. And you can see in the next slide how self-care is the first area. And then you have uniqueness, adventure, and respect. And all these translate into four di directions. I would say the directions are also personas. The kinfolker, the expressionist, the nomad, and, and the elite. So these are the four personas that today we look at when we communicate the brand to our audience. Because of the time constraints, we will be looking at the kinfolker and, and the nomad. So the nomad, and without taking you through so much details, um, it, if you look at the lifestyle overview of the of um, of um, the um, sorry the kinfolker. Uh, the kinfolker is um, it basically is a person who experiences everyday hustle. You appreciate everyday pleasures, and again, you're you're always looking to balance your work and life. Um, and you enjoy every on the weekends. You enjoy every moment of reflection, and taking care of yourself is something important to you. And when you socialize, you socialize more and and more of an intimate uh, groups of friends. Um, so what we did is we looked at the relevant demographic profiles and we sliced them into three subgroups. So we have the, the, hus the hustler kinfolker, um, which is the age of 28 to 35, mature millennials, what we call. Uh, the ne next group is the student kinfolker and 18 to 22 college students. I also call this group is the generation, not only generation Z, but the, the Zoomers. And, and, and like Daniel said, it's so important not to forget the 18-year-old um, you know, audience. I have an 18-year-old daughter. And as Daniel said, she is, she's born in, uh, into an online uh, world. She's, she, she orders things. 
the first time when I when I uh, she was making an order online, and I said, "Do you give me my credit card or or my debit card?" And she said, "That you're you, you didn't know that I can do cash upon delivery." And this was a few years ago, and I said, "Does that does that exist?" She said, "Yes, of course. I don't need your credit card." So you know they're already there. They're shopping online. They know what they're doing, and and um, so we have that group also in mind. And of course we have the multi hyphenate, which is a 25 to 35 millennial with multi dimensional lifestyle. They're looking for versatile watches to fit in their um, uh, life. And again, when we when we build our communication, when we do our photo shoots, when we hire our models, we have to keep all this in mind so we can really connect with this audience. So just to give you a little bit of um, uh, a feel and um, uh, to, for you to feel this uh, this group of audience, this is a lifestyle mood board. Um, and then also to give you an idea, what are they consuming today online and offline? Kinfolk is the magazine, the Swedish magazine, uh, which is uh, you know leading lifestyle and culture magazine. Uh, we have Harry's, Daniel's in the US. You must know Harry's. It's a uh, They've done really well online shaving kits. Uh, it's, I think, around $300 million company now, and they made it big time online. The Nomad, uh, it's uh, to, just to have an overview of their lifestyle. So they do the everyday, uh, the daily grids. They dream about the next adventure. Every day is exploration, and they go on with random, unplanned wandering. Weekends, they're researching the unique adventures, and really what defines this uh, uh, audience is what I like a lot is the journey is a destination. You're always on a journey. You don't arrive at where you want to go. And that's really fuels a sense of adventure. We've done the same thing. We looked at this demogra demographic profiles and we, we've actually, we have sub three sub profiles. The young backpacker is a 16 to 28, 22 college student who loves traveling. The weekend explorer, the 25 to 35 millennial, uh, explores the city, uh, you know, city parks, etc., and the casual social hiker, the 25 to 35 millennial, who loves active social hiking with friends and socialize and, and feel part of the community. We definitely take that in consideration when we work with models or when we work with influencers. Um, you know, um, uh, we look at their age, but also what are, what is their interest and and who they appeal to when we talk about influencers. Um, and this is just a lifestyle mood board. You can see travel and adventure is very strong in there. Just an idea of what are they looking for when they go shop. Um, yeah, everyone, know, you must know now uh, about the, the luggage brand from the US away and Saturdays, the menswear brand from US. Um, so these are just some examples. And what I wanted to take you to now quickly just to to show you the result of this research we've done. And, and after conceiving the brand, we have taken all that feedback and created two lines for Legato. The first line is Evolve. And basically it's an elegant sports uh, line with has the minimalistic design. And uh, Evolve is a 44 mm size case. It has uniquely beveled sapphire crystal, which is known to be uh, scratch resistant. Uh, all the watches are dressed with uh, Italian leather straps and with equipped with chronograph movements. In, in this case, we're using Japanese movements. And our straps has this interchangeability fe feature where you can actually change your strap uh, and, and feel free to do what you want with your watch. And of course, the watches are water resistant up to 50 meters. If you realize the names, we didn't only give the watch reference number, which I didn't mention here, but each watch has a name. And this is deliberate that when we communicate, we use names that can also appeal to our target audience. Moving on to the tempo line, we start with tempo 41.5 mm, and it's a contemporary line with, um, again, with a distinctive design. We have a, a very nice uh, dome sapphire crystal, uh, uh, and, and of course, which is the uh, scratch resistance. And the tempo line, it really we see it as a versatile line. The size is um, very suitable for his and her. It's a unisex size. And um, the movement we're using here is quartz analog movement with hour, minute, and a small second hand at six o'clock, just above six o'clock. 
and uh, we, we use Italian leather. And in this line, we also have the opportunity to introduce the Milanese mesh bracelet. And of course, it's water resistance up to 50 meters. And you can see it, it's in different cases, different colors. Uh, you have khaki gold, we have red gold, marble dials. And uh, if I take you to the next uh, slide, it's this, uh, this is a tempo size 33 mm. It's the same line, uh, smaller size. And this is for sure, it's a female watch um, with again, different dials and um, different color cases and with leather strap and Melanese mesh straps. I tried to be very brief, but that's the result of our, of our um, um, you know, we worked on this for about a year and a half. And as Anil said, we were unfortunate that it really coincided with Corona. So we launched the brand May uh, 2020. And it was a time that, you know, it took about a year and a half to, you know, establish a company in Hong Kong, in Dubai, and to work on and you know, creating a team, recruiting a team. We have a watch designer and architect. Uh, it does take time, and um, we were unfortunate with the timing. Now I say unfortunate, um, but also we had a mind to to be to go online first because again, to be a global brand, you have to go online first to be launched digitally. The issue we're facing uh, at that time was everyone started to go online. So all the brands that were never online, so they started to put so much money into online. So again, you have to be very creative on how you, 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 you show the brand and how you get the attention because everyone's online now. I mean, you have uh, brands that you never think of. If you think of Cartier today, they have a huge campaign now targeting millennials and they're very active online on social media. So again, it's... Uh, it was, a, it was interesting to go online first and launch the brand. But if, of course, with that comes challenges and comes with um, uh, you know, how we do it and how we, we really put the brand out there among all these big brands who've been established long before us. And, and again, it's all about digital. It's all about, um, I would say, artificial intelligence. Uh, it's about really finding your way around, which, which was a bit difficult in the beginning. I can tell you now, it's, uh, we understand how to do it. Awesome. Your watches really look nice. I'm sure uh, Lagardo will do Thank very you. well. So now moving on, uh, Daniel uh, said it in so many words that uh, the changes which are happening are very rapid. And uh, of course, millennials, millennials have a large role to play. But if you look at the uh, luxury industry, irrespective of the category, it could be a jewelry brand, it could be a watch brand, handbag brand, fashion brand. The world of luxury was earlier dominated by European brands. And there is an American school of thought because the uh, European school was harping more on craftsmanship, timelessness. They would not launch new products and launch products in limited edition. And with the way Americans, uh, even Coach and uh, Tiffany, they had a different way of doing business. And then came Apple, who has really changed the game totally. So there is an American school of thought and there is an European school of thought. So if you go by as art imitates life, I'm sure most of you must have seen the web series, Emily in Paris. A millennial American goes to Paris and the way Europeans look at jewelry and Americans look at jewelry is totally different. Of course, there is a lot of exaggeration in the uh, series, but in real life, now Bernard Arnault's son, Alexander, he's a millennial himself. He's moving from Europe to America. He's taking over American brand Tiffany. So is the world moving towards homogeneity, that is one. Because the world over, consumers <coughs> buy luxury brands, the same brands, but the way re they relate to the brand is a little different. So I will leave it at that because we have very limited time. But there are two issues which we should now address. One is the sustainability. The world over, millennials and Gen Z, 
want the world to be a better place to live. So with specific mention of a new category of lab-grown diamonds, which is being talked about for many years, but in the last five years, it is really becoming a talk of the world. So I would invite uh, Daniel and Katrina to discuss about the lab-grown diamond jewelry as a category and their role in sustainability and what is the potential for making a world-class luxury brand out of lab-grown diamonds. So let's begin. Daniel and Katrina. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> let me let me maybe um, you know discuss uh, or tap a little bit into um, what you said um, about you know is the world getting a more global place or so and um, and then I come to and I will kind of take this into sustainability. So I think that um, we need to think about luxury in a completely different way. I don't like this this notion of um, you know craftsmanship or you know we do the best materials, we do this and that. This is basically been um, you know how the luxury industry has been presenting itself in the past. But I would say today, and I, I try to be maybe a little bit provocative. It's completely useless and is also not relevant for people. Um, because I don't care if a company tells me they do the best materials because it's not them to tell me, it's me to judge as a customer. And I think we need to shift the way of thinking from we do certain things, we do the best, we, we have the best people, the most passionate things and um, the best craftsmanship, this traditional way, we have to th shift this to what is relevant for consumers. And if you ask me what is my definition of luxury, to me, it's a very simple one. And it's basically what we do day in, day out. It's to think, how can we create extreme value for our customers? That's the only thing that matters. And it's always in the eye of the customers. It's not in the eye of us as a, as a brand. The customer judges. If for the customer, a new category or a new brand creates more value than the brand before, then they will gravitate to that brand. So this means we have to become much better in terms of understanding the world in real time. So therefore, for me, it's not like everyone is going to uh, gravitate together. It's actually the opposite that brands need to do. As a brand, you need to think, how can I be as distinctive as possible? How can I create as much value as possible? How can I basically do things that others are not doing? Is there maybe an untapped need somewhere um, that I can um, address and where I can create for this segment of consumers extreme value. And most importantly, we have to do this in a very authentic way. And that is very important because a lot of brands are always talking about authenticity, but then they're not authentic. And there is no such thing as 90% authentic or 80% authentic. Either you are authentic in what you do or you're not authentic. So this means that brands first and foremost have to build brand equity. And now I come to sustainability because this is very closely related. If I basically go now and do audits of brands, <clears throat> I would say almost independent of every brand, I let's say I go on the website, I click through the website, I will always find a page that the brand is telling me they are sustainable. But they are often not sustainable. And, and they, are, they basically often kind of, I call it greenwashing, they claim that they are more than they actually are. And this, is, this may have worked five years ago or 10 years ago, but it doesn't work anymore now. Consumers are so much more savvy and they don't want just brands to talk about something. They want to really see what brands are doing and they want to understand what brands are doing. So my invitation to brands across the, the, all the different categories is to really think in a different way and to think about sustainable business models. You have to link sustainability to value creation. If you just say you're sustainable, you're not creating any value because everyone else is saying that. You have to really think, how can I stand out? How can I make things so differently that the way we do it using sustainability actually is creating extreme value for consumers. So this also means a completely different way of, of uh, shifting. I don't care if a company tells me, oh, we are, we are sustainable. I want to know how they are sustainable. 
And I think that now to your question of combining this with, with uh, lab grown diamonds and so on, it's definitely a new category. It's a category that has been used, I would say, more from a, um, more maybe in the industrial area more than for retail because um, you know with with uh, mined diamonds there's always a little bit of a story there is the age of the diamond that had to be kind of harvested and so on so um, there is a huge value also in something that is natural so the question is if there is a value for consumer in something natural what could the value be in something that is lab grown and I don't think that a lot of companies have yet really basically really thought about this and thought about how can we now make something lab grown really special. Because if you grow something in a lab, you can maybe manipulate it and maybe you can make it a little bit different than it is in nature. So my belief is as long as lab grown diamonds are just imitating what is in nature, they will never be perceived as the same thing because they will not have the the history or the <clears throat> the naturalness to it but if it is perceived as something kind of nature plus where you can create something that maybe nature can't do there is a huge value creation model so i think that it's all about value creation and um, we basically have to always start with the consumer have to think what are the consumers looking for how can we excite them how can we create desire and then we have to think how can we use sustainability to do this and potentially also how can we use maybe new technologies to do that so this is my take on this so i definitely admire your, your candid view so i agree on some of your points i disagree with some of your points but i am not an expert so i would now invite katrina because she is a jewelry insider and she knows jewelry more than i do and of course i uh, welcome an outsider's perspective, but it is the insider's perspective that we are eager to listen to. So Katrina, please share your ideas on the lab grown diamond business, the jewelry, the opportunity, and the brands which have made their presence felt in the last few years. Please, Katrina. It's quite talk to talk after Daniel because he puts everything so uh, precisely and uh, in his uh, you know very uh, um, professional terms. I look at lab grown diamonds as uh, having people who are vegetarian who are not. They coexist, and uh, there are, will be people who prefer lab grown diamonds and those who prefer natural diamonds. I mean, for me, my personal view, it might sound a bit harsh, but you know, we all want to have the beautiful designer bag, and not all of us might have the fun, so we'll buy a, a fake bag. So for me, a lab grown diamond is like a fake designer bag. Uh, the only advantage right now, which obviously is advertised from brands who use lab grown diamonds is that they're affordable. So it's like buying something that people aspire to have, but for uh, a smaller price. Um, and as I said, I think the, the only value or the only reason why they do it is uh, for saving money. In terms of sustainability, um, I would disagree. Uh, lab grown diamonds, uh, are, in my opinion, are not sustainable because uh, also there's a lot of, um, okay, you don't dig deep in the earth uh, um, like you do with natural diamonds, but you use a lot of power, uh, you know, a lot of other resources to grow the diamonds, which also affects the environment. Uh, so in a different way, uh, so I wouldn't say that, you know, natural are not as good just because, you know, you, we have to um, get into the environment of the, the, where they're mined. But uh, there are brands who use uh, especially lab grown diamonds and lab grown gemstones like emeralds and, you know, other ones that can be uh, grown. Um, they do disclose it. The biggest issue that lab grown diamonds uh, have um, and the effect on the industry that um, there might be dishonesty in the business when a lab grown diamond is used especially if it's something small used for i don't know pave setting or something like this when it's used and not disclosed so this is the issue i think this is why everyone is talking so much about the subject uh, but at the end of the day we need to think of the consumer how does consumer take it are they uh do they like the idea of having lab grown diamonds do they really want it because i just feel that there is a lot of talk about it but there is not enough demand from the consumer side i mean i might be wrong but this is just my observations of the market so i don't feel that this is going to be a long-lived trend like that uh, 
or it might, uh, you know, it might be a long list, but for a very small percentage of consumer who really would want to buy, to buy um, a piece of jewelry with a love grown diamond. I appreciate your views, Katrina. Again, uh, I wish there was somebody from the lab grown diamond industry because I'm sure they would have a different uh, opinion. No, so maybe the next time onwards, we can have a debate on this. Yeah. Uh, uh, moving to the last point. Sorry, I will come back to you later. So the, the last point uh, that we need to discuss because we are running short of time is the use of technology. You know, uh, And let's be very precise in the sense that uh, it is felt that products, luxury products, because they are uh, expensive and there is a lot of touch and feel uh, involved. So there is a limited potential as far as e-commerce is concerned. But uh, we cannot forget, you know, the poster boy of e-commerce today is the owner of Farfetch, Jose Neves, if I have um, pronounced him uh, correctly. So with respect to the Farfetch model and in particular, the potential for luxury brands. I would invite all of you to share your views, and more particularly, more more particularly, I would like Daniel to talk about artificial intelligence and social intelligence. But let me also now invite uh, Milvin first before we move on to the room, because he had something to add to. So please be brief because we have to. Uh, we are running short. True. I mean, I just want to point out uh, something that Daniel mentioned, very interesting. I never thought about it this way. Uh, when he said that um, about, you know, lab diamonds, basically, if we do, if something is different done with lab diamonds than natural diamonds, I think there could be something there to look at. Um, otherwise, I agree with Katrina. Uh, but if, if we can achieve, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, with different types of diamonds, with and new features with you know I'm not uh, I'm not into diamonds, but I think it could it could make us think twice about it. Uh, that was my opinion. Okay, so let's discuss about technology. Anyone can start. Yeah, I can I can take a stab on that. So um, I come back to what I said earlier. Um, in this new world of luxury, so to speak, we need to have the consumer first because there is just a dramatic, dramatically more amount of choice that consumers have now than they ever had before. So we have to basically be in an unbelievable way um, customer focused, much, much more than, much, much more than ever before. And um, this means we have to understand how consumer sentiment is shifting. Brands that are not able to do so simply have, will have no um, future. And um, because the, the, the shifts are very fast, things move very fast. And um, if we basically are not, um, are not basically um, um, able to really understand what is going on in real time, we don't know. And what I see very often is that the people who run brands simply make assumptions. So they say, okay, my brand, this is how my consumer view my brand because it has always been this way, or maybe they uh, ask a couple of consumers and so on. But what they underestimate is how fast things shift and how much consumers are also not only influenced by what we do. And when we run a brand, we typically focus mainly on our brand. We sometimes look at competition, but our main focus is our brand. So one thing that changes completely is more than 90%, um, I actually estimate probably 95 to 98% of all purchase decisions today are started digitally. So 95 to 98% of all purchase decisions start digitally. So this means the real battle is not in the store. The real battle is not about you know, the, the, the product or so. The real battle is how can we convince the consumers through their digital journey to come to our brand. And in this digital journey, we have all the other players. We have competing brands, we have influencers, you mentioned it before. We have all kinds of forces that very much are beyond our control. So we need to think also in terms of technical infrastructure completely digital, uh, differently. And I can share maybe two or three slides to kind of demystify 
a little bit, you know, artificial intelligence and the use of artificial intelligence in um, in luxury. So, if basically you you bear with me for a moment and and accept that the the battle is defined in on the digital space, then the first thing as a brand I need to know is kind of who are the players? How many conversations are there around my brand? So for example, one of the things we always do and with the brands we manage, we always try to do this in real time is I want to know how many conversations I have for my brand versus all the other competing brands around. Are people talking more about my brand or about other brands? Because if I find out that I'm not part of the conversation, then I'm simply not going to be relevant in the future. So this is the first thing. And I'm very surprised because when I speak with brands, almost no CEO can tell me how many share of conversations they have today, last week, last month, last year, but it's unbelievably important. The second thing I want to know is what are consumers talking about when they talk about my brand? And um, this, for example, what you see on the right side is, is a topic wheel. And this is, um, uh, um, we use a, a proprietary uh, software with artificial intelligence technology to do that. And we basically scan anything that is uh, in blogs, in social medias and so on um, around the brands that we manage. And then we basically see how is the sentiment around the brand? How is the sentiment shifting? And things are going so fast now. You just have maybe, you mentioned influencers, maybe an influencer that spoke about your brand and then people are responding to that. I need to know this if I manage to brand. Yeah. The other thing I need to know is I need to know the competitive dynamics. I need to know where are my what, what are the the conversations that my competitors are initiating. Um, where are they actually talking about? Which platforms are they using? Are they on Instagram? Are they on Twitter? Um, how are they influencing my customers? We have done projects recently where we saw that, for example, store traffic of brands completely dried out. People were not going to the stores anymore. It was not because of the pandemic. It was because before they went in the store on their digital journey, they were intercepted by their competitors. The other thing that you want to understand when you run a brand is what are the nuances in consumer sentiment? For example, are women talking differently about your brand than men? And surprisingly, practically no one when I speak with brands can tell me that. I personally believe you need to know this in real time. You need to know what happened in the last two or three hours. Otherwise, how can you manage a brand? You also want to know what are the interests of your consumers or not only of the consumers, also of people who talk about it. Because if, for example, I run a car brand and I don't know that my consumers also like music and sports, how can I con uh, give them relevant content that engages with them? Because if my competitors give them more relevant content, what will the consumers do? They will gravitate to my competitors and they will not buy my brand anymore. And then we also need to know, we spoke about influencers. Who are the key influencers on my brand? I have almost never met a manager that can tell me. Yeah, Think about that. Who are your key influencers? And what if your competitors are your key influencers? Have you ever thought about this? So we are in a complete different battle today than we have been just a couple of, um, of years ago, one or two years ago. What are the key topics that are trending? around your industry. You know, um, um, Anil, you said, okay, you disagree with what I was saying around the lab-grown diamonds and it's fine to disagree, but I'm a data-driven guy. You know, I just look at data. I don't care what people tell me. I look at data. I see what people are, um, what people are talking about. And if we are measuring what is trending and what is fading, we know what the conversations are out there. And this is so unbelievably important because it doesn't matter what I think. I always like to say the only thing that matters is what are the consumers thinking when I manage a brand? How are they reacting to a message that I send out? Because I've seen brands that are spending millions of dollars in advertising and that brings nothing because the content is not relevant. The content is not re resonating with the consumers. Consumers are not responding to it and their competitors are just better. Sometimes competitors spend 90% less and get dramatically more conversations. Think about the car industry. Tesla to date has never spent $1 in advertising, not $1. And they have the majority of conversations. So the way how they are able to influence is different. 
And you have now the competitors of Tesla, they're spending billions of dollars in advertising. They don't get a fraction of the conversation, then Tesla spending nothing. So the game is completely different. And if you ask me who are going to be the leading, for example, car brands in the future, it will not be the traditional ones. If I would have shares in BMW today, I would sell them. I don't believe in this company anymore. Not if they are not changing dramatically, not if they are not changing drastically and become much more relevant. So it's a completely different game out there. And um, this is a game that you cannot win anymore with gut feeling or with you know, just looking at your Instagram feed and thinking, oh, look, I did a nice post and I got 5,000 likes, completely irrelevant because it's only relevant if I get more conversations that are triggered out of my um, content um, than my competitors have. And at the same point of time, it may sound a little bit you know, challenging now or threatening um, to, to maybe to the audience. And I would say it's threatening if you don't change. It's threatening if you don't think differently now. You will not be there. In five years, you will not be there anymore. The speed of change is so fast. It's, we are basically at a, in a time with brands, like when we had the transition from digital photography, so to speak, to, or from traditional photography to digital photography. We're in a completely different um, time, completely different game, new rules, new technologies. And um, these technologies that I'm showing you are not incredibly expensive. Very often they're actually, because they're highly automated, they can be even cheaper than having like, a bunch of analysts. But without them, you will not be able to fly your plane anymore, so to speak. So these are basically the instruments of modern times. And again, three or four years ago, we would not have had this discussion on you know, how to use artificial intelligence and technology in managing brands. But we are now in a different times and content becomes dramatically more important. And the content is only relevant. Content is only relevant if, the, if basically what um, we do resonates with consumers. It's so, so simple. It's the consumer who decides whether they buy us or not. They never had more choice. There's never been more competition. There's never been more new brands. There's never been more new technologies. There's never been more innovation. So for the consumers, it's perfect because they can choose. And if the brands decide not to serve them, not to give them extreme value, it's a choice of the brands, but they will not be around for much longer. Awesome. Your presentation, your slides, and your views are really thought-provoking. But having said that, uh, I think uh, the time is now opportune to take a few questions. So uh, there is Akshara Dalal with us, but before I invite her, our friend uh, Jayant Raniga, the director of Pure Jewels, has sent an advanced question. So uh, if you are in the audience, please raise your hands and I would uh, request Anu to unmute him please. and also put his video on. Jayant, why are you there? Please raise your hand. So I, try think and locate, not, uh, I think he's okay, not there. He's not, yeah. Okay, if he's not there, then let's invite Akshara. Please unmute her and video on mode, please. Akshara? Yes, I'm here. Ah, welcome. So you had a uh, lot of questions. Uh, students had said questions in advance to you. So please uh, pose your questions. All of us are here. And I would also now request uh, Anu to activate the chat mode and the q and Yes, Akshara, please, please. Perfect. Uh, so very good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to all the audience present. I know you're joining us from around the globe. Uh, those were absolutely some very insightful 60 minutes that we had. It clearly proved that, you know, luxury does not work in a vacuum. Uh, we did have a lot of questions, but we have shortlisted them, keeping in mind the time frame that uh, we have. So the first question was directed to Mr. Daniel. Uh, he, so the, the student asked that shopping is an integral from a brand from the country of origin proves the authenticity of the brand. It also excites a lot of consumer to go down to the origin of the brand and then buy it. With all the restrictions that we still face in traveling, how
to to Paris, then uh, you know you cannot get you cannot so to speak bring bring Paris uh, digitally to the consumers. But what I think what is very important is um, is maybe something kind of you know related. With product creators, so to speak. Product is part of the content, but in principle, we have to send content to our consumers. Otherwise, we are not resonating with them. So it doesn't matter whether this is a store or whether this is a website, whether this is social media. If, for example, let's say if a brand would be positioned as the Parisian brand, so to speak, if I take now this example, then I would want to see some kind of Paris themed uh, positioning, then this kind of content has to be along all the different touch points. What is extremely important is consistency of messaging across touch points. It doesn't matter whether they are physical touch points in stores or whether they're digital touch points. And what we see is that Seeing that the shifting landscape has created so many pockets of momentum that a lot of brands can sort of tap into it and excel in their own domain. Uh, for our next uh, question, I think that's directed to Mr. Milvin. Uh, the student, because I think this uh, question came in quite recently right now after you told a major challenge that you faced while you were launching Legado. Um, I think it's uh, the biggest challenge was uh, when do we start advertising? When do we, um, I mean, when do we connect to our audience and, and how we connect with them? Because as, um, as, as, as you heard from all the speakers, that this is a time that we're going through that we've never been through before. So it was, um, it was something that we really uh, you know, we had to really sit and, and talk to our uh, agency and, and, and with our, uh, uh, you know, we have our own um, digital media department here and, and, you know, looking at the content and looking what to do and um, do we go, do we work on social media, do we go, how do we do it, do we advertise, on, do we do something on Google first and, and again, w which country to go to first. You know, uh, U.S. We wanted first to tackle the, the American market, and and you know what was happening in U.S. Uh, last year, so it was uh, it was a challenge to be honest with you in the beginning, uh, because you know we were walking in unknown territory, so it was more of slightly testing with small budgets and understanding the response, and then we would go a bit you know we, we would have a bit more confidence to go forward. Absolutely. Much ahead. And we really look forward to seeing that in India also. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Red, so the student asked that you're an aficionado of fine jewelry, watches, and gems. You have shared your expertise on designers, established brands, and precious masterpiece pieces. I mean, especially now, I think it is the time when there is no uh, different countries. We're all one world and um, for sure, you know, but at the same time, when I used to travel and when I see jewelry design now, there is certain elements of um, design which are specific for certain markets. Uh, and because also they need to correspond to the likes of those markets. So there is a
can see it sometimes, you know, they don't like to show their wealth or um, be more, they like to be more understated with their jewelry choice. And they will go to America, they like big stones, you know, you can see uh, in New York, big diamonds uh, uh, shining in the middle of the day. So um, I think jewelry, as many industries, as all the Just a little bit to the likes of uh, where they're at or who they target. Oh, that's absolutely right. I think I think we don't have any borders anymore. Uh, so Akshara, I think uh, there are some questions from the audience also, and we are running short of time. Yes, so yes. can I invite? Uh, Can you unmute him, please? And maybe if you have questions for the speakers, yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone, and to the panelists and the audience. Anandji, uh, fabulous session. Uh, I didn't realize that we are one and a half hours into the session. Uh, it was so um, uh, fluent and uh, many, many insights, uh, uh, insights I could get, <coughs> like, uh, you know, um, uh, micro key opinion leader was something that is, that is interesting and that has uh, a stuck in my mind and uh, you know geotagging of the customers also what melvin was saying uh, that is interesting and uh, another thing that stuck to my mind was 95 98% of the the decisions uh, are uh, you know initiated online that is something that is uh, that is going to open uh, a lot many people's eyes uh, towards uh, luxury and how how we have to approach uh, uh, our uh, consumers. And uh, the share of uh, online conversation is something that uh, blew my mind because we are every that most of the jewelers in India are currently focusing on, uh, you know, customers who are 30 plus because uh, they have the, uh, you know, disposable incomes and uh, they are more inclined towards gold and, and jewelry. ability that you are relevant uh, to uh, Gen Z. So how do I balance both the, both the things that I remain relevant to my current, uh, you know, target audience and also be relevant Yeah. yeah, I can take this question. Um, so, because we work a lot with, with, with Gen Z and advise a lot around Gen, you know, pivoting towards Gen Z. So, my recommendation would always be. failed with this so a lot of brands think okay the young consumers they cannot afford so this is why we make now a cheaper line for them and so on this is not what the what the younger consumers are looking for i would say gen z is they have they are maybe the the as i said earlier the most difficult consumers to get because they're the smartest in my point of view they're the most informed um, these guys really do their homework they and this is maybe the the
from customers. They will, be, they will really do the homework. The 50 or 60 year old customer may just walk in your store and you can convince them. The 20 year old customer, they will have made everything online. They will have checked everything. They read every review. They scrutinized your brand before and only then they come into, into your brand. So you need to think much more in values than in, ex in kind of trying to be young at all, um, at all points in terms of execution. For example, a brand that has been unbelievably successful in the last couple of, especially in the last two quarters, um, in one of the youngest markets in the world in China is the Hermes. I don't see Hermes trying to be young at all, at all, um, um, in all, um, um, how to say, uh, uh, at all measures, but they are very relevant. They have rele a re relevant story and they are very value driven. So younger consumers, they look more, more for values. They look much more for experiences. And I've been reading now a couple of the questions in the chat and I can, will try to kind of put this in, into that. I, I always like to think about a little bit in the extremes because the extremes help us. So for example, why should you go to a store in the future? Why should we even bother to go into a store? Because to go into a store means I have to go, for example, into my car, I have to drive to the somewhere, I don't know, to the city, then I have to find a parking space, I have to walk into the store, I have to interact with people. In a sense, I lose two or three hours of my lifetime to go to the store. Let's think about this. And the only reason why you can get me into a store in the future is you have to entertain me in some kind of way. You have to give me a great experience. How many experiences, if we really are critical with ourselves, how many experiences that we give our customers are really great? I personally, as a shopper, almost never got a great experience from a luxury brand, especially in jewelry. For me, jewelry is maybe one of the worst experiences overall, because it's, let's say, what is a traditional jewelry experience? There's a jewelry store, there's maybe security at the door. So I feel almost like I'm maybe I'm the threat to the jewelry customers, to the jewelry place. And then there is. for the Gen Z, for this. We think about you really giving value. The elder customers you can fool the younger customers you can't fool. So it's a completely different way of thinking that is needed for, for Gen Z. They will not come to your store because you do something that looks like um, uh, young and is not uh, relating to the brands. I've seen so many brands fail that just try this and don't basically um, build into their, um, into their heritage or build into their brand. The brand DNA is even more important in the future than it has been in the past. I also think that we are shifting towards away from logos. For example, I don't care about logos anymore at all of a brand. When we think the last thing I, I'm interested in when I analyze a brand is how does the logo look? Because the logo is, has been a thing of the pre-digital area. I don't need it anymore because I don't, I, I just, I can connect with the brand um, just, you know, through the browsers and so on. I don't need the logo, but I need the content. I need to know what the brand stands for. And younger consumers, they really want to know what the brand stands for without bullshitting, so to speak. It has to be authentic. And also... Um, you gave, gave a very important point, sustainability. Um, I just got in, was more anecdotal evidence, but from, um, the, um, from the head of Asia Pacific um, of one of the leading luxury brands, he told me that over the last couple of weeks, maybe even months, two, three, four months, the amount of people who come into their stores, especially young consumers, 
and really want to know what they are doing for sustainability. Where are the materials sourced? How are they sourced? Do they have certificates for that? Is everything traceable? And if the store staff cannot answer, they leave, they turn around and go. Has never happened in 20 years. Before people were just maybe asking some questions, but they were not really seriously asking them. Now consumers want to know. So I always like to say it's a choice for the brands. The brands can do what they have been doing all the time. And then I would say, good luck. In two or three years, you will see that the numbers will go down. Or you basically adapt and um, look into what are consumers looking for without scrutinizing your identity. So this would be kind of maybe my long-winded answer. And I try to kind of include some of the, the questions in the chat into that. Thank you, Daniel. And I think uh, it is now my time to express gratitude. Firstly, for all the panelists who on a weekly off have spent their time, precious time and inputs. Also, it is my duty to thank the JD Institute team, Ashish Pethe and his entire team at the GJC for supporting this session. I would judge the success of a panel discussion on the basis of the questions answered and also many questions that our panelists have raised. It's really a thought provoking session because while answering some of the questions is important, but also the questions which are raised in our mind, which will provoke us to think. And I think I have many questions which I would again, interact with each one of you offline. So thank you very much. It's party time for us in India and you all deserve rest. So looking forward to an opportunity in the future. Thank you. Bye-bye. We you. will now formally end this session. Thank you very much. There are so many other questions, but uh, we yeah. will answer them by way of email. I will ensure that your questions will be addressed to the speakers and the answers will be emailed to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>